Hey guys, and welcome back to The Curious Curators. I'm Hope. And I'm Lindsay. And today, we are going to talk about a place that neither of us has ever been, a place that we're both interested in, and honestly, a place that we just both belong. That is the Palace of Versailles. <laughs> do I belong there? I, I think do. you definitely belong I there. <laughs> I do. Even if I just belong there to like wander through the garden lost, because I get lost in things like that a lot. I just feel like you fit with the vibe of Versailles. I fit with like the people who lost mm-hmm. everything from the neck up or yeah, yeah. I mean <laughs> yeah. You could be a modern day Marie Antoinette. I would probably die the same as well. I mean no, <laughs> no like no shade like I would. But uh Versailles. So Versailles is a palace. Yes. In and a town. Yes. In France. You might recognize it if you saw the stunning 2004 masterpiece that was Marie Antoinette. (laughs) Or just any biopic on Marie Antoinette or uh, Louis XVI or... The 15th or the 14th. 14th. I think more has been done on Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, though. Probably. They're more tragic. Tragedy attracts. Yeah. They have a... They have a story arc. They didn't die of smallpox or gangrene. Yeah, they have Spoiler had, alert. Every Spoiler alert, everyone in this story is dead. <laughs> well, considering this was the 1600s and the 1700s, uh, yeah. Yeah, everyone is dead. Well, I mean, I guess to be fair, someone is still in charge of Versailles, and they yeah. are still kicking around. It's true. So Versailles is closed right now. Right, because of the pandemic. Yes, so they are... Um, France has quite quite strict laws right now. Versailles is closed. You can kind of wander around some outer gardens. It's just okay. like a park or something. But Versailles is closed. Normally, Versailles is open. And for 20 euro or about 30 US dollars, yeah. you can have a wander. You can see the palace. You can see the gardens. The Petit Trion, which I still didn't look up how to say that because I'm fantastic at this game. And yeah, it's, I think it's about 30 minutes by train from Paris. I hope everything sounds absolutely worth it. Yes, it does. I would love to go to Versailles. I would be very interested to go to Versailles. I think it would be an all day event. Yes. So you can, when I I was in Paris, we didn't go, we didn't have time. How many people dress up? Could I dress up? I think you can, I guess you can dress up just to go, but I do know because my old um, flatmate went, they do a like ball every year. Um, and you dress in the huge dresses and like fix up your hair and like men and women and they do a big ball and I think it might be in the Hall of Mirrors, I'm not 100% sure. Sold. But it looks stunning. Well, I mean, that clearly they probably didn't do it last year, but every other right. year they do this thing and I don't think it's that expensive to go and I know... The girl that I knew that went, they made their own dresses yeah. and everything. Like, they were still sewing them. They took, a, they took a bus to Paris from Glasgow, which I can think of so many things I would rather do than take a bus there, including walk. So props to them. But they were sewing on the bus. Sounds like any anime convention <laughs> or fantasy convention. I just, like, I'm one of those people that... um. I can sit still if I really, really, really have to, but also I don't feel like I have to on a bus, so I'm just like, oh, <laughs> you know, like flailing all around. Um, after a little while, I can do a couple hours, but otherwise, and I think it's like 12. But you know, in in pretty much, I mean, even in America, you can take a bus to anywhere, right? You can just get on a bus and you just go. And they do mega buses there, so okay. they're like cheap. They're like. The cheaper equivalent of Ryan Air. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we can talk about Versailles and not about um, how to get there because... Nobody's going to be getting there anytime soon. And I mean, in all honesty, if we were telling you how to get there, it would be go to Atlanta and get on a plane to Paris right. <laughs> and then figure it out because we don't know either. A 30-minute train ride. But I don't know if it's like a subway type train or a regular train. That You're going to have to figure that out yourself. Train. But it's like a six-hour flight, so you have plenty of time to figure it out. So let's talk about the history of Versailles. Versailles. So for, I guess Versailles history starts ages ago, right? Because it wasn't always this castle palace thing. So Versailles was once a small town with a church. Okay. And then, of course, 
a king comes through or a prince and they decide, huh, I really like it here. So you know what that means? The town and the church have to go. They they like it in the swamp? Yeah, because they can hunt and kill things. Oh, okay. That's, I mean, that's... It is kind of swampy marshland there. Yeah. It's Well, I, how do you pick the site of a palace? Do you just like it? Because, I mean, he, they could... I would not pick somewhere swampy and marshy. Well, I mean, I wouldn't... I, they wouldn't put me in charge of picking anyway because I feel like I don't care. But this is Louis the Thirteenth went hunting there, mm-hmm. right, and decided um, he liked it. Mm-hmm. And then eventually built a little chateau. Yeah, I would probably call it like a shack, <laughs> but like <laughs> a hunting lodge. Right. So he built somewhere that he could hang out. Yes. And that is the start of everything yes or that's the start of the location as we know it so it after louis the 13th came louis the 14th yeah it's because it's very you know very there will be many louis very adventurous naming in the french monarchy Um, he had been the monarch i think since he was four yeah like he was young yeah, he was he was four years old when he took the throne, um, and he would be basically the builder of Versailles that we know today. Right. And I have a I have a great quote uh, okay. from a documentary about him. So it says, "So powerful, he took his name from the sun. So dominant, he made the haughtiest aristocrat bend to his will. So insatiable, no one mistress could satisfy him for long." Oh. So Louis was this, or Louis the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth, Sun King. He's the Sun King. Um, usually, if you will see him, he is dressed extravagantly. Yes, he was a flamboyant dresser. Actually, stunning. Ten out of ten, in my opinion. And he he really set the tone for his courtiers. You know, fashion became extremely important. If you were unfashionable, you were not going to catch Louis the Fourteenth's eye. No, and really, you could go into Versailles as long as you were dressed appropriately. Yeah. Because, you know, the people just in and out all the time out of your house. Like, it's whatever. But but you had to be dressed all right. Like, you couldn't be in, like, work clothes. Yeah. So, in when he was 27 years old, he wanted to construct his palace at his father's old hunting lodge, where he used to play as a boy. Um, so, he hired Louis Laveau, the greatest architect of his time, apparently, um, to create... Versailles. Okay. Um, Louis, his first plan for Versailles actually tore down the hunting lodge, but Louis the Fourteenth was insistent that the hunting lodge and his father's memory remained. That's actually kind of nice. So they did. They created something called like the envelope, where they basically enveloped it on three sides to preserve it, but to essentially create a new palatial structure. And it was funny because. He basically, this marshland was pretty much the worst place he could have decided <laughs> to build his palace. There were mosquitoes. Mm. It was, the ground was not very solid. There were no, he also wanted massive gardens. Mm. There were no, uh, none of the types of trees and things he wanted. Um, he actually uh, hired Andrew Lenotre, and Duolingo's probably gonna be mad at me for that pronunciation. Uh, I'm taking French with Duolingo. Duolingo. He keeps reminding me every day, like a passive aggressive boyfriend. He's like, "Well, I guess these, I guess these <laughs> reminders aren't working. We'll stop sending them to you." You're like, "Thanks." <laughs> so uh, he was the landscaper, and he was the most celebrated landscaper of the century. Which I didn't know that was something that people was a minded. Thing, but yeah. Hey. Um, so they had to uproot trees from other places to bring them to Versailles. Of course they did. Because he couldn't pick like an easy place. Right. It had to be just like, I mean, if you've ever seen pictures of Versailles, it is ridiculous. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. It's like magnificent. So like, of course, nothing is going to be easy. We're going to be difficult here. Let's yes. And pick it all up. It here. was essentially Louis picking the worst place as a sort of, show of i'm more powerful than the land yeah i'm the sun king yeah so like everything is going to bow to me yes 
it was it was a sort of show of dominance over nature, essentially. And he was going to make it bend to his will. And I mean, honestly, it worked. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, lastingly. It worked lastingly. Absolutely. Um, and he also decided that he was going to make this the seat of France. So, and it used to be near Paris, right? Yes. Another palace that was like on the other side yes. of Paris or something. Um, which I'm sure you can go to that one as well, but... He Clearly, just, it's not memorable because I don't even know the name of it. He decided since he was going to spend so much time here, it was going to be the seat of Paris. So they actually had to build um, a bunch of places where the ministers and the courtier, courtiers could stay because that's what's going to be the new governing. Right. And then it has to be absolutely extravagant because any like heads of state or other kings yep. or anyone else that comes to visit, this is what they're going to see. Yep. So it has to be too much because in... I don't know if you've ever seen any picture of like palaces or like anything like that. It's always just a little bit too much. And that's perfect. <laughs> so like, you know, it's got to be a little bit much. Yeah. So it was um, basically, let's see. When you said too much, I actually had something in my mind. Um, oh, I'm sorry. oh, it was supposed to be a showcase for French craftsmanship and royal splendor. Um, basically, they wanted to outdo Italy was the big goal. Because Italy was considered the center for taste and okay. for the arts. And they wanted France to become the center for taste and the arts okay. in Europe. So their whole goal was to outdo Italy and okay. its architecture. And this was, he had a, he is not the one that built the Hall of Mirrors, is he? Or no. Is he? Well, yes, he is. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't Louis Laveau, which was the original architect. It was, hold on, he died and Mansart was the next architect who expanded Versailles with more apartments and designed the Hall of Mirrors so that Louis could see the gardens and the sun from everywhere in the room. Yeah, because it was like originally like a walkway type thing, yes. but it was really uncomfortable. Like, it would get snowed in, the light wasn't right, so they basically built the Hall of Mirrors, which is, I think, one of the most well-known yes. places in Versailles yes. today. And I was reading, like, kind of a gossipy thing that was saying um, the best mirror makers were from Italy. Yeah, Venice. And they were trying to call like them to France and like the head of their guild or whatever you would call it at that point started poisoning people so they wouldn't lose their secrets. And I was like, hmm. Yeah, they wow. would only accept Venetian mirrors. Which is like, wow. In the Hall of Mirrors because it was considered the best mirrors. Yeah, and I mean, the Hall of Mirrors is absolutely stunning. Yeah. But... Oh, like, could you imagine? Like, I hope you're not having a, a bad hair day if you're stuck in there because... <laughs> you could see yourself from every angle. Like, I can only imagine just being in tears some days. Like, this is awful. <laughs> anyway, so yes. So something else, because Louis Fourteenth had mistresses, um, his favorite mistress was, for a while, because he... Cycled. Cycled. Was uh, Du Montespan. Ooh. And she had 20 rooms in Versailles. Jesus. Do you know how many Queen Mary Therese had? Three. Eleven. Eleven. Oh, eleven. What would you even do with 20 rooms in a palace that big? You'd have your know. own kitchen. <laughs> but she wanted more. That's insane. It's she so wanted to have more than the Queen. Interesting. And, you know, everyone is, like, packed into Versailles like sardines. Yeah. And she just has 20 rooms, probably mostly empty rooms. Well, and honestly, during this time, during Louis XIV's reign, it would have been terrible to be in Versailles because it was constantly under construction. Yeah. And it's now it's far. So, I mean, like, yeah. today, today, 50 miles is nothing. nothing. But back then, yeah. Yeah, back then it was a hike. So it wasn't like you could hang out at Versailles during the day and go home to your house at night. Yeah. You needed rooms in Versailles. Yep. And you wanted to be close to the king. So you needed rooms near the king in Versailles. Mm -hmm. But so did everyone else. Mm -hmm. And there was always construction going on to expand and to finish because, and, and the other thing too was, you know, there were no safety regulations. So no. lots of people would die. Um, and they would carry their corpses off in the night so that they didn't demoralize the rest of the employees. Mm. And it was dirty. I yes. mean, construction zones are always dirty. There's dust, there's mud. It was dirty. Yeah. Like, there weren't enough bathrooms mm -hmm. at Versailles for, like, even a quarter of the people that lived there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about the royal court of France, and people are using the bathroom in the hallways. Yep. 
that's where that's where we are yeah <laughs> like, and that's so just insane when you think of you know just how like ridiculously proper courts are thought to be like yeah but so then you have the smell of all the construction you know everything from tar to well and they use animals to horses yeah and then you also have the smell of people's people relieving themselves a in a potty yeah and i mean it would be bad enough in the winter i would think but in the summer oh it would god have been unbearable plus they're planting all of these gardens mm-hmm. and i read somewhere that said it literally made people ill because there were so many smells in the gardens themselves that doesn't surprise me so like while versailles was stunningly beautiful like it would have been a hard place to live yeah a miserable place to live yes absolutely and if i'm you can correct me if i'm wrong it wasn't even finished when he died correct the i believe the theater or he wanted to build an opera house a theater place um and he kind of said let's leave that for our successors because he was getting much older and he had an option between building more apartments or completing the theater and i think he chose to build an apartment okay and then when he died we got another louis yes the 15th if you're keeping track this is the third louis yes um so louis the 15th um but he kind of moved back and forth a lot. He didn't really live at Versailles completely at first, at least. Right. Like, they were... Which, like, that... It just sounds exhausting to be a part of the French, like, court. Because what do you mean they just moved around? They yeah. Have whole households full of people, plus all of your servants, plus all of your pets and animals, work animals. And your stuff. Yeah. Because, I mean, do you think that a king travels light? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to a cabin in the woods, and I have two bags packed. Yeah. So Louis the Louis the Fourteenth was actually his great grandson, um, the great grandson of Louis the Fourteenth, because Louis actually lived until he was 76 when he died of gangrene, and he had what, what was gangrened? His leg. Okay. Um. So. The five-year-old actually outlived his older brother, his father, and his grandfather. That's rough. And he, his coronation ceremony, I believe, was when he was 12. Okay. But he was technically king starting at five years old. Okay. Um, and uh, he inherited a mountain of debt. Oh, well, <laughs> don't they all? Um, and uh, he... I, I believe Louis the Louis the Fourteenth's like last words were basically expressing regret that he had involved himself in so many wars. Okay, well, I and I will be honest here. I don't know a ton about French history. Um, they actually um, they would take some of the silver from Versailles, like sneak it away. Uh, to pay for the war against Spain, England, and Holland. Hmm. Well, because they were kind of at war with England, like, back from Henry VIII. They were days. always at war with England. They really were. Um, they, that had, was, they had a hard life. That was one of their traditional enemies along with Austria. Which um, would be, that comes into play later, of yes. course. Um, with a marriage. <laughs> a marriage for the ages. Yes. And there's the train. Coming to take us away to Versailles. Yes. Um, so Louis the Fifteenth did not learn from this. Of course he didn't. And he declared war against Austria and Britain. And he actually personally led armies against them. And people were very like impressed with Louis the Fifteenth. He was called the Beloved. You would think that it would be a way to rally your people to do the exact same thing that you're asking them to do. Yes. Like, you're asking them to go to war, but you're going to go first. Yeah, and it was it was essentially, he was, he was quite loved by the people early on in his reign. They saw him as this heroic figure who was leading battles. He led a very successful battle as well. Um, and honestly, at first, he was very uh, loyal to his wife. Um, Which is a rarity. Yes, the Princess Marie Lezinska, 
um, pardon me if I pronounce that incorrectly, of Poland. Um, they actually had 10 children together. And she, uh, she later tried to keep him at bay as much as possible because she was tired of being pregnant. I don't blame her one little bit. Um, and he, like, they, I don't remember what I was going to say. It's fine. <laughs> well, but the, it was not unusual for the king to have mistresses, which he no. later did. Yes. It was supposed to represent sort of the virility of the French lineage and the French people to have a king who was insatiable. Well, and um, he um, had some pretty famous mistresses. Yes, um, he did. I think he had the most famous mistresses of any king. Yeah, of any... Any, I mean, any Louis. Yeah, of any French king that that comes to my mind anyway. Yeah. I mean, like, I know, like, five French kings, and we're talking about all of them, so there's that. <laughs> but, oh, and Charlemagne, but... <laughs> Charlemagne. <laughs> but, um, you know, like, it's... First, he had the DeMille sisters. Uh, there were five, and he had an affair with all of them. Um, oh, they're, like, the French kings could never just be, like, normal. They got, but like, he had to renounce them because he fell ill, oh, and he yes. took his last rites, and he denounced them publicly, and then he said, you know, if I get better, I'm going to rededicate myself to France. I'm going to be a better king. I'm going to dedicate myself to the people, and he got better. Most French kings were also defenders of the faith, were they not? Yeah. Yeah, so they're all um, they're all Catholic. Hardline Catholics, especially like Louis the Fourteenth, especially in his later years. Um, he secretly married the governess of his children after Marie Therese died. Um, he uh, married uh, Madame du Montespan. Yes. Oh, Madame du Montenot. Okay. Um, and she was like a hardline Catholic, and so she kind of transformed him into like very strict yeah and i think like historic so historically just like english kings before the anglican church was born right. um french kings were catholic yes and usually um even if they themselves were not extremely devout they would give off the illusion yes. of being very devout and the pope would often name those kings or a lot of kings honestly like defender of the faith so yeah they're like basically they especially at the end of their lives they have to like do the right thing by like the standards of the church because, yes because it was their job to defend the church yes you the have to touch them yeah you have to confess you have to denounce uh your wrongdoings your wrongdoings which includes your mistresses yes so they were sent away yeah and then you know if you made a comeback from your deathbed, as I feel like people often did in these times, then you could just go back to doing what you were doing Medicine before. Medicine was kind of a crapshoot, to yeah, be Yeah, like you were just kind of winging it. So you could just go back to doing what you were doing before, but then the next time that you got sick, you just do it all over again. Yeah. And that's kind of what the Louis... Yeah, and that Louis the Louis the fifteenth, I think, was the biggest perpetrator of yeah. this. Because um, he would do this... Pretty regularly. Pretty regularly, because he had, he had a few brushes with death... Um, in his life. So dramatic. He, had some breath he was actually that. extremely dramatic. Um, he was the subject of like an assassination attempt. Um, at one point, um, somebody stabbed him. Oh, I um, can only imagine that that would go over about as well as me being stabbed. Yeah, so. it did not go over. I mean, he was extremely dramatic. It was just a flesh wound. The doctors said it was no deeper than like a fingernail. But he got extremely dramatic about it. Literally. He would he would scream in bed and say it was worse than the doctors were saying and they were trying to downplay it and he wanted to take his last rites and <laughs> literally um, me if I got stabbed. And his wife kept trying to tell you're fine, honey, you're fine. The doctors say it's nothing. Um, but he was extremely dramatic about it. Um, and they think it might have been a huge blow to his psyche to realize, you know, that people hated him that much that they were willing to try to assassinate him. Which is interesting because I feel like um, no one is going to be so perfect that they're universally loved. Yeah. So he could have just maybe taken a minute and calmed down. Yeah. Because, like, no no king, no, no matter which king we're talking about at this point, has been just universal. King Arthur, maybe. But, you know, like... Yeah. Well, and one <laughs> of the things that he did um, was he did... Um, ally with Austria. 
Um, and that was one of the biggest issues, and that was one of the reasons that people started to hate him so much that there were assassination attempts made against him. And the alliance that he made with Austria yeah. was the engagement of his heir, the Dau- Dauphin, Dauphin, Dauphin. Dauphin of France, Louis the Sixteenth, to Archduchess Marie Antoinette. Yes. Who would later become queen, but at the point she was like an archduchess. Yeah, she was um, the daughter of the empress. So she... Moved over to France. Another Marie Therese, but... Yeah, it's a very common... Well, and she named all of her children very similar things yes. to that as well. Because um, Marie is not pronounced the same in... Uh, like, in the Habsburg, it would have been right. like a Marie. We call her Marie because that's... Because we Anglicanize everything. But I think each each Louis had a Queen Marie. Yeah, that, which, I mean, I guess that's fitting. Because it was Marie Therese. It was Marie Lezinska. yeah. And then Marie Antoinette. So I think of all the people that we're talking about, Marie Antoinette is the most famous. But she doesn't become queen instantly, of course. Right. Um, because Louis is still... Louis kicking is around. Kicking around, causing trouble. I mean, like... Um, he did actually... He was the one to finish the theater. Okay. At Versailles. Um, and it was for the wedding of oh. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. So, yeah, because it wasn't like she walked on the Hall of Mirrors to this large, like, room where, like, all of the nobility could gawk at her. Yeah. Because, you know, she wasn't French, so people were like, <clears throat> yeah. Can you, can you go somewhere else, please? Yeah. Um, they She was not, um, in the beginning or the end, the most, <laughs> foreshadowing, the most right. popular of well, people. Well, it was because she was from Austria. Like, uh, Marie uh, Lezins- Lezinska, she was... Polish, and no, she wasn't like very popular, but nobody outright hated her. She was right. mostly ignored, yeah, um, in the court, um, which is why she got along so well with Madame du Pompadour, which was one of Louis XV's mistresses and probably one of the most famous mistresses, yeah, because she was nice to her, yeah. Madame du Pompadour was nice to the queen, and wasn't it like there were so there's like a ton of your whole family is just like kicking around in this one house together yes i mean a very large house in all fairness but still yeah like not just like you and your mom and your dad but also like all of your aunts and uncles and cousins and everything all lived together and wasn't it um louis the 15th had like three sisters that were there as well possibly possibly that kind of um influenced marie antoinette quite a bit with like her dealings with madame de berry and everyone else you know, like, don't like her yes. and all that. Yes, so You have so much drama and so much intrigue as well. And I think when Marie Antoinette came to France, she was a 13-year-old girl. She was 14. 14. She was 13 or 14, I thought. She, she, was she wasn't going to know mean people like that. Yeah. Because I can only assume that if you grow up in that way, you're quite pampered. So like, Right. And she was probably well-liked in Austria. But yeah. in France, people, Austria was their traditional enemy. So it, this is so we're getting into like some tough times anyway, just because now yes. we have an Austrian queen, but things get ev- or princess I guess, but things get even tougher when um, Louis the Fifteenth comes down with smallpox. Right, and this was after the Seven Years' War, where France lost against yeah. England. So um, like they're they're not having a good time in France. Yes, and he ended up having young girls brought to him instead of having a regular mistress. And then he uh, has mistress Madame du Barry, who's a commoner. So he's losing a lot of, of favor. favor. Um, and then he tried to abolish parliament. Yeah, which always works so well. When people uh, which was basically an abuse of royal power, although some people really supported it. Um, and then he contracted smallpox. And there were, of course, rumors that it was a venereal disease or something. Um, and we do not exhume kings, so... It, it was smallpox. Yeah. Like, the doctors, we have records of the doctors. Yeah, saying um, that it was smallpox. It was smallpox. Because I was like, we don't exhume kings to find out what they died from. But That's the thing is, nobody do. really cared when he died. People cared when Louis the Fourteenth died. Yes, but he had lost so much favor yep. by this point that people were kind of ready for a change. And I can only assume that people might have had a little bit of faith in Louis the Sixteenth. Yeah. In he Marie was, Antoinette. They were young. He was young. I think... Um, they weren't even 20, were they? Louis was 20, and I think Marie was... 
like oh she was she was young see they're at least i i will say this for them at least they were very close in age they were very close Um, in age so they had a chance at at least being friends well and when they were at the coronation um and the wedding um something that louis the 16th was quoted as saying is uh god is my witness i never wanted this like he never wanted to be the king yes and marie responded and said lord help us for we are so young to rule and I mean, honestly, they were children. Yeah. Can you imagine yourself at eighteen or twenty, and someone literally hands you the keys to an entire kingdom, and you're just meant to like make a go of it, but but do a good job. Yeah. Well, and Louis the Sixteenth was trying to be very forward thinking. He was trying to be um, a pro- proactive in the enlightenment which was going on he actually had his whole family inoculated against smallpox which was extremely new and considered risky oh yeah probably because he was scared of the same thing happening all over again yeah because his oh man was that his grandfather Grandfather? i think it's his grandfather yeah because i think louis was not the first one in line either like his father and his elder brother both died a lot of people died yeah (laughs) that's that's to go down to to go down to louis the 16th um, you know, so I don't know how prepared he was. No, and then, like, I can, I think, like, if, even if they're like, well, you're going to be queen one day, you're like, you have one day. Right. But that day isn't supposed to come, like, five years later. It's supposed to come 30 years later. Right. When you've had enough time to, like, grow up and understand what all was going on. Right, because, I mean, Louis the, granted, nobody survived Louis the, 14th except for his five-year-old grand great-grandson but he lived until he was 76 well i mean like look at queen elizabeth today she's like 94 so you expect to have some time to prepare but um louis and marie did not have that time and they were i mean they were young they were they were young they were wealthy yeah and they had i mean it sounds awful to say but like they had other things they were worried about yeah so by the time they've become the king and queen, like they're kids and they want yeah. to have fun. Well, yeah. at least Marie wants. Marie to have fun. Marie wanted to have fun, um, and Louis had other issues. Like apparently, they couldn't consummate the marriage for uh, various reasons. For various reasons, for about eight years. Yeah, so like when they were king and queen, probably not. At and they that point. they suspect that Louis didn't know how. Yeah, they think you said. I think you told me yesterday he's suspected to have. Asperger's autism on the spectrum. Something, they think he might have had something. He definitely had uh, melancholia, essentially, just like Louis the 15th. Yes, and he also did have a psychological break later in his life. Um, But he was, he he didn't know how to consummate the marriage. um, So that didn't happen for a long time. And that was extremely stressful on Marie. And that also makes the public look down on you yeah um, so especially because they would be blaming the austrian and not him yeah and it it would already be pushing you out of favor yeah. with with well and marie uh got letters from her mother and things like that yeah like it's, like why haven't you had kids yet it's all very uncomfortable they did originally they did eventually have four children right it's four yes children. yes and um, that was eight years into their marriage yeah. they had a daughter and then they had a son yeah and so that was kind of their their duty as it is. Um, but uh, Louis was really trying to make reforms because France was staring down the barrel of bankruptcy. Yeah, and they were a little bit extravagant. Yes, but, but I think to a lesser extent than their predecessors. But yeah. there was still this idea that these kings had to be extravagant yeah. to be considered... Um, legitimate essentially yeah so they're a bit extravagant and everyone else has literally they said i read somewhere that the cost of versailles adjusted for today's inflation would have been between three and four hundred billion u.s dollars i mean like sounds right that's an insane amount of money for your house (laughs) so plus you've gone to war Mm-hmm. Multiple times, wars are extremely expensive. Louis Louis the Sixteenth also goes to war, yeah, um, and decides to back America during the American Revolution. Yes, thinking that it would be 
advantageous for him afterwards. Which, I mean... It was not. Yeah, all it did was set the stage for the French Revolution. Well, and America turned its back on France, essentially. As soon as England let them go, they said, all right, we're going to trade with England. Yeah, it's... When the the expectation had been that they would trade with France. Yeah, and, I mean, the Americans could not have won the revolution without France. France. Um, Which, if you don't know anything about the revolution, like, you can look it all up, but you can also watch the movie The Patriot when the French come. That's the turning point of the war anyway. Um, but, not, well, they were financing the war even before then. So people yeah. always think, all oh, the French came in at the very end. But they had been financing the war quietly. And then they finally sent over ships yeah. full of people. Because they were scared of supporting a revolution of Democrats, essentially, yeah. and Republicans and, you know, people yeah. who were not for a monarchy. And they, so, basically, they... You know, these two are, I mean, I would, I think they tried. I really do believe that oh, they yes. tried. Oh, yes. Louis tried. He, but, he hired, um, he hired several finance ministers over time. He hired uh, Monsieur Turgot, who was basically an enlightenment finance minister, and he wanted to tax the nobles because during this time, the cler- there was the clergy, the nobles, and everyone else. Everyone else was taxed. And everyone else couldn't afford food. Right. Like, we're at the point where the people of France are starving to death in their homes. They did not tax the wealthy nobles, and they did not tax uh, the clergy. And so this minister said, you need to tax the nobility. Of course, the nobility rebelled. And so, you know, Louis fired him and hired another guy. And another guy tried to put, this other guy tried to put forward other reforms and eventually came back to, we need to tax the nobility. And so Louis XVI said, you got to go, because the nobility revolted again. He hired a third one whose, whose solution was to spend more money. I mean... You have to spend more to get more, was essentially his idea. Which is what we're still told today. You have to spend money to make money. Yes. Um, and which- that, that doesn't work when you're facing... When you're looking down the barrel of bankruptcy. Yeah. And it put them in actually a much worse situation. And this guy also came up with, we need to tax the nobility. And the thing is, without the support of the nobility, like, he would still have remained king. But you're looking at assassination attempts. You're looking at a possible coup. You're looking at a lot of things You would that have to happen. put forward despotism because he had the Council of Notables who had to approve of the laws, they were nobility. Right, so they were never going to approve that. Like, it, would have to be a mood of, it would have to be a move of despotism for him to push that forward without with, and then, their consent. So basically, what Louis wants to do is avoid a revolution. <laughs> we're like, yes, let's avoid a revolution. Um, it didn't work. No. It didn't work. Um, the only name that I can think of from the French Revolution is like Monsieur Guillotine and Robespierre. Those are the only two names that come to mind. Because like Mr. Guillotine, which the guillotine is named after, and then Robespierre, who right. was also guillotined later. But Voltaire. Oh, Voltaire was revolutionary. Oh, and Marat, was that his name? The guy who was stabbed in the bathtub? Maybe so. I think so. So okay, so we know. For Regardless, it's fine. Revolution is brewing in France. Revolution is brewing in France. Marie Antoinette has kind of retreated to the Petit Triange, this little like house in the gardens, where she can like be herself. Um, Louis is scrambling, and he Louis- has a mental break. He's. They say he kind of wanders the halls and speaks of like the visions that haunt him. Yeah. So like. And he has severe breaks in reason. Um, yeah, it's it's not going well. Yeah, it's... It, Versailles, he's, Versailles is standing, Versailles is fine, but Versailles is probably the only thing that is... The building is standing, the political and social structures within it are crumbling. Yeah, so we're, I mean, they're struggling. So they're not, this is not the time that we're trying to re, like, to make it fancier right, right. now. We're... We're struggling. Yeah, to there's keep not a lot of expansion alive. during Louis the Sixteenth. Yeah, we're struggling to keep ourselves alive. Pretty much for their whole time, they're struggling to keep themselves alive. Yes. And then it doesn't matter anymore. They're not in charge. Eventually, eventually, it all it all falls. 
yeah. part. And they, they consider a number of different things to try to fix it. Yeah. But the problem is Louis the Sixteenth was indecisive. He They say he was a decent man, which makes for a bad king. Right. So it's, you know, there's just no way. Do you remember exactly what year? The So it was like 1793, 94 that the revolution starts? Is that when it starts? I don't remember the dates. I don't either. So basically the revolution starts and the palace becomes something of a prison. Yeah. Um, the royal family is held in the palace before their execution. I mean, they're they're not executed for a little while. Like, we've got some time. Yeah. But then, like, don't they still use the palace for things? Mm-hmm. Because it's still, I mean, at this point, it's relatively centrally located. It's a very large space. Well, it has been made the center of the state, essentially. Yeah. So... So even if you're it's not... It's already like, prepared to function for that. Yeah, so y- your new government can just step in. Yeah. I mean, even if you're stepping, like, d- differently. So they can all step in. And the palace is still just kind of used for what it's supposed to be used for. Right. It's the center of government. And then, again, the Napoleon comes into power eventually. And he uses it a little bit, too, doesn't he? <laughs> I think Napoleon might have used it a little bit as well. Um, I could be a little bit wrong. No, okay. I have it in my notes. I'm just like, do do do. So the court of Versailles, the court left Versailles in October 1789 for Paris. It would never return. Napoleon chose not to settle here because of the connotations of the royalty that came before him. Right. Um, but a lot of like dignitaries and everything else, like even Americans that would come to visit wanted to see Versailles. Oh, yeah. It's like a very, it's a very big thing. But eventually they decided, what better to do with this than make it a museum? Right. Which Which, is what happens to a lot of... Yeah. The entirety of the Vatican. Yeah. um, But making it a museum did preserve what was left inside of it, but also the building itself. Yeah. Which... I'm always happy when an old building is yes, preserved. Um, and I think, from what I understand, and like like we said in the beginning, we've never been to Versailles. But from what I understand, it is furnished like it would have been furnished. Yes, I've seen photos of yeah, it. Yeah, and it's supposed to be like the art is there, the chairs, the yeah. everything is there. So, Speaking of art, something interesting that happened, um, Louis the Sixteenth was very obsessed with the life of Charles I of England. It was actually one of his ancestors. Okay. Um, Basically, the king who was executed by his people. Um, Oh, yeah. Mm. When they moved into that short period of time where they didn't have a king because they they exiled Charles II and executed Charles I. Um, And that... That king's story haunted him, and uh, during his time there, somebody moved the painting of Charles I's execution into his bedroom. That's kind of horrible. Yeah, so he was constantly harassed, um, not only by that, but by pamphlets um, calling him weak and dumpy and all kinds of things. And Marie Antoinette, of course, was the victim of the licentious... um, Yes pamphlets the dirty cartoons yes. and everything else which i mean it's so interesting to me how enduring things are because yeah. that's still like basically oh, they were writing about her on the bathroom wall yeah and let them eat cake was not something she said it was something that they said she said it was a was, political cartoon yeah because i mean honestly like if you've ever like really read about like the real that's not she wouldn't have ever said that Honestly, no one would have really talked to her about yeah. anything. It and wasn't up to her. She was, you know, she did party and she did have expensive tastes because she was, you know, a young queen. But she did, after a while, she tried to support Louis through the reforms yeah. and, um, you know, push him to make these hard decisions. Yeah, and she, I think, was probably the more decisive one in their marriage, but... I mean, if one person literally can't make a decision to save their life and the other person can sort of make one, you become the decisive one in your marriage. So Yeah. Well, I that. 
Louis was trying to be decisive, and each time he would try to put in these reforms, but he had so much opposition that he buckled. Yeah, like, and of course, we can sit here and say, like, oh, like, you know, so indecisive, but never having had to make decisions that would affect the entirety of a country. Um, well, and he was completely isolated with nobility. Yeah. So it was everyone who was against him. Yeah. He had his finance minister who said, we need these reforms. He said, we need these reforms. Marie Antoinette was like, we should probably do these reforms. And everyone else. And everybody like, else was like, no. But you also have to consider if you're stuck in an isolated place, I mean, even if Versailles could probably fit a town like of 30,000 people in it, um, how hard do you think that it is to pay off a king's guard? Yeah. So, like, you're literally looking at the fact that you could be assassinated at any time by any of these people because no one in the French court, I'm like generalizing, but no one in the French court is like kind and loving, like they're cutthroat because yeah. they have fought for those positions. Yeah. Like I'm like, you. F they fought for that. They have probably, some of them have probably killed already for the yeah. position that they're sitting in. So do you think they're gonna let the king stand in their way? Well, and it's so interesting too because Louis the Fourteenth kind of implemented a lot of these things so that there were no political machinations against him. So that's why you have the dressing yeah. ceremonies where all the nobles would line up and fight over who gets to put gets to hand Louis his shirt. Yeah. Because it was a public spectacle to be dressed and undressed in the morning. The meals were a public spectacle. Yeah. They were all hoping he would talk to them. Like it was the, the whole They didn't have world. time to plot his demise. Because the whole world was about getting his attention. That's all yeah. he wanted. I actually wrote down an interesting fact about little Louis. So apparently in his apartment, he had each room inside was dedicated to one of the planets and the Roman deity connected to oh. it. There were only seven planets back then. But I think that's so interesting because he was the sun king. So all oh, of yeah. his rooms revolved around him. Yeah, I and love Apollo. It. He was he really liked Apollo, the sun god. Yes. yes, I quite enjoy things like that. I think it's really fun. Something interesting about him too is he popularized high heels, like just wearing them. Because was he quite short? Yes, oh, okay. Louis the Fourteenth was short, and so he popularized wearing heeled shoes. Because mm. heeled shoes existed before then, but I right. think they were riding shoes to yeah. keep you in the stirrups. I mean, he fair. popularized walking around in them so that mm -hmm. he looks taller. I like it. So I do have one thing I want to mention before we sign off of this. Absolutely. And that is when, um, so I listened to this podcast a little while ago. I listened to a podcast called Supernatural with Ashley Oh, Flowers. yes, this one. And there is a really interesting incident of these women in 1901 who say that they time traveled at Versailles. Um, and apparently they are not the only ones who have made claims like this. Um, at Versailles and in other places in France. So I don't know if this is like French thing. Um, when I was in France, it didn't happen to me. So I'm already jealous, but whatever. So these two women, they have one is a principal of a school and another is the teacher. So they decide to go to Versailles um, because they're in Paris for whatever reason. So they go to Versailles. And they decide they want to go see the Petit Trion, the little mm -hmm. Marie Antoinette's house. And Mine, this is 1901, so like I don't know what the brochures would have been like. I can only imagine today that you have like a life-size map or something that you just unfold right. and like hold up. But I'm sure it was much smaller back then. So they start walking, and okay, so it kind of annoys me when it's like, well, they didn't know what path to take and they got lost. Because like, what do you mean? You know, like you got lost, but there's like 500 other people like right beside right. you. Right. So like, okay, so whatever. So they're walking and they don't see anyone. And the trees take on like this weird flat appearance apparently, and they get this horrible sense of like foreboding, and they're very like anxious. And they come across two men, who they think are palace gardeners who are wearing green coats, and they of course are like, we're trying to get to the, like the petit trion, and the guys like it's like you know like that way they're like all right so they walk further and they see like an old house like this old plow outside and like a woman handing someone um like a jug of water but they're just kind of like whatever see i'm the kind of person that would be like excuse me am i going the right way but like they're not those kind of people apparently eventually they come across this structure i heard it i saw it like seen ugh, said different ways i think it's a gazebo I think okay. it was a gazebo. And there is this, like, creepy, swarthy, like, scary, scary, scary man. And they're terrified of this man. Um, it was later. This 
man could have been the Comte de Vaudreuil. Who okay. knows? Who was a friend of Marie Antoinette. She, he was um, having an affair with her friend. So they were all friends. Oh, okay. But this other man comes out of nowhere and leads them to the Petit Trion. And they're walking in and they see a woman and she's sitting on the like porch and she's painting or sketching. And this footman runs out and tells them, like, you're coming in the wrong way. You have to go in the back door. So they go around the back, but then it's like things are normal again. Okay. Um, so they're convinced. Um, they are so convinced that they go on to, like, write a book. And these are not just, like, poor girls from a poor family. Like, they are well-written. Like, the principal has opened, like, two or three schools. Like, they're quite educated women. But they think they were – they time-traveled. They think that they time-traveled back – so this was on August 10th. So they think they time-traveled back to um, – August 10th, 1792. So you're saying they're smart enough women that they could presumably come up with a story to make money off of. True, true. Um, basically, this was um, the day that a different palace was besieged and the King's Swiss Guards were literally massacred. Oh. So this is right before the revolution started. So there have been quite a few things. Some people say maybe they had like a mental break of some sort. Some people say maybe they walked into a... Historical, historical reenactment yes and it has also been put forward that they were lesbians and they were so mad in lust that they just that that's just what they came up with so when did that theory knows? come forward um one of their students wrote a book like to counter their book so like in 1912 15? or something yeah like so which i just thought it was really interesting apparently a lot of people see like ghosts and other things at versailles I'm going to say, like, ghosts and other things. Um, when I'm mad in lust, I also see ghosts. <laughs> right, of Marie Antoinette, though, just, like, of something random. Yeah, no, specifically when I'm mad in lust, I see the ghost of Marie Antoinette. Yeah, I thought you might. They also see um, Marie They also see Marie Antoinette either in her living quarters or in the place that she was held before execution. Um, you mentioned about how Lou would pace around pensively and, like, mutter to himself. Mm -hmm. They often see him doing that. But then also people see people like um, foreign ministers from different countries, Benjamin Franklin. So I think maybe oh, Versailles. Oh, yeah, he did visit, and he was a big celebrity. People loved him. I think maybe Versailles is just a gathering place for ghosts, and they just get there to party. Like, I'm not sure. Okay. But that seems like what happened. But I don't know. I just think it's really interesting. Like the headless hunt in Harry Potter, all the ghosts get together. Exactly. I think that's what it is. Um, that, that must be it. That's the only excuse I can come up with. I just think that it's like really interesting. Um, I would like to go to Versailles on August 10th and see if anything creepy happens to me because I don't go in here without my phone so I could record it. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Apparently a lot of people think that Versailles is like quite haunted or creepy, but I said this to you yesterday. I think that if you go somewhere expecting that, you will be even more creeped out than you normally would. Yeah, and is there any castle in the world that is not accused of being haunted? Right. And especially, like, Versailles does have a relatively dark history. A lot of people have died in Versailles. Yeah. A lot of people died in the construction of Versailles. And Versailles' last residents were beheaded. So, like, it's had a rough go of it. So it wouldn't surprise me if, like, it is a creepy place. Maybe next time we talk about a historic palace, we'll have to talk about Neuschwanstein. Is that the one that looks like Cinderella's castle? Yes. Okay. I can't, I, that's not how I would have said it, but already then, Lindsay will always be pronouncing that particular phrase from now on because that's not how i would have said it <laughs> new or something that's how i would have said it but i think that's all i have about versailles today what about yeah, you i'm good all right guys well that's all we have for you today we'll be back next week yep bye guys bye